So today we'll talk a little about counters. Um, so counters, counters obviously can be used to count. Surprise, surprise. And there's a few different types that we'll talk about. The first, divide by n counter, um, is a name given to sort of a general purpose frequency divider. Uh, so if we have an input, like this clock here, I had said before that using the T toggle flip-flop, we can create a frequency divider. So you can see I have this input here, um, and the output toggles uh, at a reduced rate. So for every two clock inputs, you can see it's generating one clock output. So for example, here we have this clock goes high, low, high, low. So there's two inputs. And in that same period, the output is only toggling the one time. Um, so that's the clock divided by two. So we have a divide by two counter here with a single T flip-flop. Divide by four, we can combine two T flip-flops. Divide by eight, um, if we have three T flip-flops in a row. So you can see again on this logic diagram, or on the timing diagram here, we have the input clock, clock divided by two, divide by four, and divide by eight. Um, and again, we see, for example, the divide by eight is taking eight input cycles to go through a full high-low repetition. So here we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and in that eight, the, that divide by eight is only toggling the one time. Um, we can also do this with D flip-flops. Uh, so I chose with T. If we use D flip-flops, you can use the Q complement output, if available, or in this case, I've just inverted the Q output um, and fed it back. So we can see that it's forming basically a toggle flip-flop from a D flip-flop um, because the output will become the opposite of the current state. And again, divide by 2, divide by 4. So where you might use one as the most basic example, if you open up any cheap clock or watch or something, you'll almost always see this small crystal inside it. So inside here, there's actual piece of crystal element that vibrates. And it vibrates at a specific frequency. In this case, um, they use this watch crystal frequency, 32.768 kilohertz, or 32,768 hertz. Um, and where this seemingly arbitrary number comes from is that 2 to the power of 15 is 32768, which is to say if you combine um, 15 T flip-flops in a row, you'll actually have a divide by 32768 um, counter. So if you input uh, 32768 hertz clock frequency here, um, at the output of this chain, you'll have a one hertz clock. So they use this type of thing to scale down the 32.768 kilohertz signal to a one hertz signal, which then, then advance the clock hand width. Um, and the reason you can't just have a one hertz crystal is because it is physically vibrating a piece of crystal. Um, and the, the size of the crystal you need to have a one hertz crystal is huge because you can imagine a sort of a one hertz waveform requiring a lot of space. As we get below a certain size, you can make the crystal physically smaller. And this is sort of a good trade-off when they were you know, first designing this between how many stages of the T flip-flop you need versus the size of the crystal. Um, and they've used that for years now. And it's still pretty standard, actually, for watches and real-time clocks. So those simple counters I was just using to divide a frequency. A more advanced, we'll call a binary ripple counter. And a binary ripple counter is counting the sequence we all know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, et cetera. Um, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, and decimal. And we can actually create it what looks like the same way. So here I'm using JK flip-flops set up as T or toggle flip-flops. Um, so we notice we're connecting before I had connected the Q output to the clock input. 
now we're using the Q complement output, or you know you can invert the clock, whichever. Um, and again, this is effectively a toggle input because it's J and K tied to one. And what you'll get here is that the output, and here it is implemented. Um, again, here I've imp I've complemented the output before feeding it in instead of using the complemented output. We can see, for example, it starts here. Um, so after each clock, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, uh, zero, zero, one. So you can see how it's counting the expected sequence. And then it wraps around to zero, zero, zero. Um, so you can see this simple counter is counting up. Um, as expected, 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, and then returns. Uh, we can make a down counter by actually connecting just the Q output directly, so not complementing. And we can see here, for example, we get 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, um, 1, 0, 0, and so forth. So you can see this is giving you sort of the expected, where is that? I write that right? Yeah. Um, it starts to give you sort of a different counting sequence. So one, zero, zero. Um, a different counting sequence. So that actually one isn't set up as a down counter. Sorry, I lied. It's counting just a different sequence. So with the ripple counter, there's a problem that the outputs here, you can see, is feeding through. So you can imagine if I have a clock that changes, um, it takes you know some finite time, say a nanosecond here. And then it takes another nanosecond to go through here, and then, say, another nanosecond to go through here. So the outputs aren't changing at all the same speed. Um, so one output will change, and then the next output, and then the next output. Instead, what we'll have is a synchronous counter, where we want all the outputs to change at once. So for all the outputs to change at once, um, we'll have a clock connected to the clock input of the flip-flops. Um, so we know that much. We know for these to all update at the exact same instance, we need flip-flops and we need the clock connected together. So now when the clock pulse comes, um, there's no delay. So before, the clock was moving through each flip-flop. Now it's arriving at them, and the outputs are updated synchronously, exactly at the same moment. Um, and the initial question is, how do we connect up these J and K inputs? You can't do it the same way, or the counter won't work, and you can show that. So how you connect them up is you look at what we need for the count sequence. So this is Q0, this is Q1, etc. Um, so you can see Q0 is just toggling, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So you can sort of guess that that just gets tied to BCC, um, because we know at this point the output will always toggle. We formed a T flip-flop. Um, we notice with the next one, it's counting to 1, um, or it's this output here goes to 1. You can see it's toggling every time the first counter is one. Um, so what you can sort of guess is that we actually just tie these two together like that. Um, so now whenever the first output is one and the clock happens, Q1 will flip. So this gives us the first two bits. Um, but what about Q2 here? So now what we need, I'll switch Uh, what we notice is here Q2 has changed, and it's staying that way. And it only changes, so here it toggles again, when these two bits are one. So when the two preceding bits are one, we can see Q2 is toggling. So these two bits are one, this toggles. Um, so what we can sort of decide is that we can just and... Q0 and Q1. Um, when they're both 1 and we get a clock pulse, we'll toggle Q2. In the same way, you can sort of notice or 
guess that um, Q3 is only toggling when all three bits are one. So the three preceding bits are one. So to t decide when Q3 toggles, all we do is connect up something like that. So now we based on Q2. Um, as well as all the bits. So now when Q0, Q1, Q2 are all one, we want Q3 to toggle. Um, so based on this, you can sort of see the general structure of a synchronous counter. So the synchronous counter is considerably better than the ripple counter because we don't have the problem that we're running into where the bits aren't updating at exactly the same time. Now they are updating at the same time and they're sort of a rewritten design of it. Um, and that's actually missing in this. Is it missing what? A what? No, no. So that's why we need the we need the logic circuit to decide when it toggles. Um, because if you just like say you just connect those together. So, you know, if you tried to create it, you said, I'm just going to make it the same way as with the ripple counter. Yeah, like what you'd see is at this point, that would work. Um, but now, right now, because the output's one, you'd actually get a toggle here. So you'd get a one there. So, yeah, so you can see why we need that, these AND gates to create the higher ones. Um, another type of counter is what we call the ring counter. So in the ring counter, there's some extra logic here, but you can see it's basically, there's four D flip-flops, um, and they're just connected together in a ring. So we can see the output goes there, 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 and then back around. Um, and sort of the ring comes from an obvious name. And how we'll use it is I've also set up, you can see the preset and reset pins, the clear pins have been connected such that when you initially set the reset pin, um, all it's going to do is load 1000 into this. And if I change my color. So initially we'll have 1000. Um, and every clock pulse, it's just going to shift that one around. And it's just going to keep going around and around. So the count sequence becomes 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so forth. Um, so the ring counter is just used to keep a single bit high as you're scrolling around. So we can actually design arbitrary counters as well as these specific examples I've given. So these examples are probably more common in what you would see, um, you know, the canon 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. And the procedure for an arbitrary counter is we're given some design spec. So here, for example, I'm saying I want you to count 0, 2, 3, 5, 6 and repeat. Um, I don't care about the rest of the numbers, they're not going to appear. I don't want them to appear in the output. So there's a general procedure we'll be following. We'll draw the state transition diagram. We'll draw a state transition table or write it. We'll choose the flip-flops um, and determine the required inputs. And then we'll design logic to realize the required inputs. So this is what we were given before. So these are all the transitions. From this, we'll create that transition diagram. Um, and the transition diagram is just, we'll say, you know, 0, 0, 0. And then we go to 0, 1, 0. And then we go to 0, 1, 1. Draw little arrows. Then we go to 1, 0, 1. Oops, 1, 0, 1. 1, 1, 0. Um, so that's what the state transition diagram looks like. So there it is rewritten a little nicer. Um, and the other states just we don't care about. We don't want them to appear in the output. So you can see it's not just a straight binary counter sequence. 
Um, next thing we'll do is draw the state transition table. So this table is saying if A, B, and C are the outputs, and this is the current state of them, so A, B, C, what is the new state? So 0, 0, 0, for example, the new states are 0, 1, 0. 0, 0, 1 isn't a valid state, so we don't care what the outputs are for that state. Um, 0, 1, 1, oops, or 0, 1, 0, we then go to 0, 1, 1, so you can see how that works. 0, 1, 1, we go to 1, 0, 1. Um, 1, 0, 0 is again, just don't care. It's not a valid state for our counter. Um, so we'll put these don't cares in here to simplify the logic in later steps. Um, from 0, 1, 0, we go to 1, 1, 0. And from 1, 1, 0, we go to 0, 0, 0. And the other state, 1, 1, 1, we assume won't happen, so it's don't care. Um, so this gives us the state transition table. That is rewritten. It should be the same. So you then select the flip-flop to use. Um, all, well, actually, I won't show here, but I'm going to use a T flip-flop. You can use any type of flip-flop. JK flip-flops often give you the best logic. Um, most com That is to say the most compact. So... With any flip-flop, we have that state transition table we talked about earlier. And that table is showing you to go from Q to Q+. Plus. Here's the inputs I require. So if I had chosen JK, I would have two inputs I'd require here. Um, and you may have some don't cares in there as well. Now what we have to do is figure out the flip-flop inputs for a specific required state. So for example, this is the, the state transition table before, so I'm saying if you're in 0, 0, 0, we go to 0, 1, 0. If we're in 0, 0, 1, don't care. If we're in 0, 1, 0, we go to this state. Um, so now what we're going to do is look at each column um, individually, or each of the A columns, say, and see what's the A flip-flop required. So to go from 0 to 0, um, we need some specific input to the A flip-flop. And we get this from, we go, okay, 0 to 0 here, T is 0. Um, and you just go down. So to go 0 to question mark, if you don't care what state it is, you don't care what the input is, obviously. Um, so we just put a question mark. To go from 0 to 0, 0. 0 to 1, and you go up here, 0, 1, 1. 1 to question mark is question mark. 1 to 1 is 0. 1 to 0 is 1. 1 to question mark is question mark. And you can do the same thing for each of the inputs. So we're sort of using each column um, individually, so you can draw these separate if you know it gets confusing. But 0 to 1 is 1. So the question mark is question mark. One to one is zero. One to zero is one. Zero to question mark, question mark. Zero to one is one. One to zero is one. One to question mark is question mark. So anywhere there's a question mark, you can just see Again, we don't care. We're going to use those to simplify. Um, so we'll use red. 0 to 0 is 0. You can see 1 to question mark is question mark. 0 to 1 is 1. 1 to 1 is 0. So because it's a toggle flip-flop, anywhere that we're toggling, you can basically see the input is... Uh, 1. So now we have basically a design table. So there's three outputs we're going to require. So we'll do three design procedures. In this case, and there's the result, um, we'll do three K maps. So for flip-flop A, T flip-flop A, we have 
um, this truth table and we'll just go through the usual design procedure and we'll put in the question marks and the ones. The question marks because they could be simplified. So 001, 011, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Um, and you can sort of figure out what's the simplest result here, and you can summarize maybe something like this. Um, it's up to you which way to do it, because you could also have gone vertical here. Um, so there's one. There's the next one. We'll say 000 is one. 001 is question mark. Zero one. Um, so for this one, you could figure out, well, what's the simplest representation? Maybe we'll do this and actually, something like that and something like that. Um, so wherever the question marks are, we can make into ones or zeros as we see fit. Um, and then for this one, again, we'll do the same procedure we've been doing, 001, 0, 0, 0, um, And again, you can just sort of go through and simplify. So there's no choice here. And then here, maybe I'll pick these two. Um, so then from the K-maps, you can create, you can create the logic expressions and then draw a circuit diagram. So you can see the general format we're using here is, um, find a blank slide. Uh, the general format we're using is we have three T flip-flops because there's three outputs and then we adjust the inputs to them. Um, And then we create the combinational logic for the inputs based on the ABC. Um, so you saw there how I had an implementation of that specific counter. So there's uh, several examples in the course notes you can go through if you want. And they show, for example, using a JK flip-flop where you have two outputs. Um, as well as different types. And uh, the assignments that you'll be getting, I think next week we'll go through these a bit more too. So the final thing to talk about, um, and there's the example of it working, is to verify if counters are self-starting. Um, so when we had done the K-maps, we had showed, for example, that some of those question marks will become ones and some will become zeros. So I'll just redo this K-map quickly. So I had said, okay, there's one K-map, and I decided to make that a group and this a group. By making those groups, what I'm saying is that this is one. This don't care is one. This don't care is zero. And this don't care is zero, because the zeros are not the groups. Um, so you can look at the truth table. What I'm saying is that, for example, there's a don't care here, and I'm saying this is zero. Um, and this don't care, one, 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 is a one and then this is zero. Um, so what self-starting means is that back when we had designed the state diagram, there's obviously some additional states. There's the zero, zero, 001 state somewhere. Um, there's the 100 zero, zero state, and there's the 111 state. In the diagram I drew, we just had these states, and you know it rotates between them. So once it's rotating between them, that's fine. Um, initially, though, you may not have a guarantee that you start in one of those states, depending on the type of logic you're using. So if the counter gets into this state, what happens? Self-starting means that it's guaranteed to get out. So you know it might go to this state and then to that state. 
or if we're in this state, you know, it goes it goes somewhere valid. The problem is that you could have it in your design such that when you get into this state, it doesn't. It just you know loops back and it forever stays in this invalid state. So we have to check it's self-starting um, to ensure we've created something sort of legitimate. And how we do this is that you go through and you fill out, once you've done the k-maps, you fill out what did the don't cares become. Um, so in this example, I'll say, what was it, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, so you remember before I had don't cares here. Now what I'm going to do is go through and you do it for each of the TA and TB. You say, when I did the K-maps, what did everything become? The don't cares. Um, and now you can say, because again, remember before I said this state's invalid, I don't care what the next state is. Now I'm going to find out what the next state is. So if TC input is zero, um, the output won't toggle. It's a T flip-flop, so C plus becomes one. Um, and same, this one stays the same. This one toggles. So some of these were defined already, some are new. This one doesn't toggle. This one doesn't toggle. This one toggles. Doesn't toggle. Toggles. Um, so you can verify if the counters are self-starting by just going through and you do that for each of the columns. So you find for TV what are the actual states. Um, and what you'll find is basically the actual states that will transition. So if it starts in 0, 0, 001, what state does it go to? If it goes back to 0, 0, 001, um, that's bad because it's not self-starting. Because it's in the 0, 0, 001 state, it goes to 0, 0, 001, and then it'll just next time go to 0, 0, 001 again and then 001 again. Um, so that counter would not be self-starting. Whereas if it goes to something like, you know, 101, um, and it depends on how sort of how you've implemented the logic, if it goes to 101, then that's okay, because if it goes to 101 here, it's going to get into the legitimate state, caps, counting state now. Um, it's no longer in one of the illegal states. If it's not self-starting, then you basically have to change your counter design. So what that might mean is that you can go to your k-maps and you can change what the mapping was. So I had in the example of TA, um, 001 was a don't care, 01, 1 was 1, one zero zeros don't care. Zero is one. Um, so I had this example, and you know, there's a few different or several different ways to do the grouping. Um, so, for example, you could pick these two as groups, and the the reason we've selected those to be ones is to simplify the logic. But maybe selecting those as ones causes it not to be self-starting. So you actually, you know, you just want to make this a one, or you select a group there, or you add, you know, additional groups. Um, so if it's not self-starting, you can just go back to the design and tweak the don't cares to force it to be self-starting. Um, of course, alternatively, in this original state diagram, you could explicitly say, when I'm in this state, uh, I force it to be, you know, zero, 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 zero. Uh, why we don't do that originally is that it creates more complicated logic because a lot of the time when you go through the design procedure um, using the don't cares, it, it lets you simplify it because it lets you group them you know, here to create a simpler logic structure. And when you go back and check if it's self-starting, it will work. And, you know, it'll end up, it might take some weird transitions, so maybe it will go through all these don't cares, not that, not that. Um, and then gets into the correct state. So by not explicitly forcing it to be self-starting, you can create some simpler logic. If you don't care, then it might take a few steps to get started. Um, and again, you should verify that by going back and filling in the table. 
And then once you have it, as I said, you'll have these new states out here. So that's all the stuff um, to cover today. There should be a lab, or there will be a lab tomorrow. I 